The theme of uh, these is uh, Romanization, question mark, provincial cultures in the Principate. Maybe it wasn't such a bright idea to say Romanization because we don't agree how to spell it, and so I <laughs> don't even think it happened. So we're talking about something that can't be spelled and possibly didn't exist, but there we go. Um, the talks are being filmed, as you can see, because we have started uh, filming and putting on YouTube uh, our talks. Okay, uh, the first speaker is quite well known to me. Um, so, uh, it is me, and uh, I am the quacking, outgoing president of the Rome Society. Uh, when, uh, when I'm not engaged on Rome Society business, I'm Professor of Ancient History at King's College London, where I do uh, largely Roman history, largely economic, but with an interest in Egypt. And Egypt is what you're getting today. Gods, soldiers, mummies making Egypt Roman. At least I didn't say Romanization there. But, hmm. Okay, in 30 BC, at the end of the civil war between Octavian and Mark Antony, and after the suicides of Antony and Cleopatra, Octavian took control of Egypt, along with its crocodiles, uh, and which a few years later was formally made a province of the Roman Empire. In the historiography of the Roman Empire, a much debated topic, and indeed a much debated term, is Romanization. And by that I mean, to what extent, how and why, did Rome's subjects adopt Roman culture? Scholarly views have followed contemporary experiences and concerns. In the old imperialist view, there was a top-down process. That is, the Romans had a mission to urbanise and civilise their subjects. Post-colonial approaches naturally started by looking for resistance to Rome. Nowadays, the trend, reflecting contemporary ideology and hopes of multiculturalism, is to argue for a creative mixture in which local societies cherry-picked the features of Roman culture which they liked and blended them with indigenous developments to create new hybrid cultures. In Britain, for example, the resulting culture is commonly called Romano-British, and one scholar has called the process which formed it creolisation. On the old view, Romanisation was a phenomenon of the Western provinces because the Eastern Greek-speaking provinces were already urbanised and civilised. Nowadays, there is increasing recognition that Roman rule brought significant changes in the East too. Egypt has hardly figured in this debate because of the common view that it was exceptional. In my view, it's exceptional only in the wealth of its preserved public and private documents on papyrus. Most surviving papyri come from Middle Egypt, uh, the area that is just too high for me to point at, and above all the town of Oxyrhynchus, which you can see there, and just beyond my grasp, the Fayum, that, uh, the villages of that area to the, um, to the, to the west. Area. And those are Oxyrhynchus and an unknown Fayum village are the homes of the people I'm going to introduce shortly. Papyrus was used as a writing material in Egypt from around 2500 BC to around AD 1000, but it was most widely used in the millennium 300 BC to AD 700. Roman Egypt in particular was a society obsessed with written records, most of them written in Greek. For the Roman period, some 25,000 documents have now been deciphered and published. That's equal to about another 25,000 for the Ptolemaic and Byzantine periods. So 50,000 published papyri. The bad news, that's, or good news, that's around 2% of the maybe 2 or 3 million papyri, nobody knows quite how many, already in museums and universities. Okay, so we've published, after 100 years of busy activity, we've published 2% of the documents we have. <laughs> Although excavations, legal and illegal, continue today, most papyri that we have come from missions of the late 19th and early 20th centuries. And the pioneers of this activity were two young dons from Oxford called um, Bernard Grenfell and Arthur Hunt, and their excavations at Oxyrhynchus, which began in 1896 to 97, if excavations is quite the right word, uh, created the largest collection in the UK and possibly in the world of around half a million papyri. This um, talk will look at changes in Egypt in the mid-first century AD, say three generations after its annexation. 
The main source I'm going to use to illustrate these changes is an archive of documents kept by a veteran soldier who lived in Oxyrhynchus, Lucius Pompeius Niger. More on him in a moment. First, however, there's a hard bit. Everything's okay, easy after this, but I need to explain the, social, the new social and fiscal structure which the Romans created in Egypt. Under the Ptolemies, Egypt had been run largely as a centralised monarchy. Rome introduced a more civic structure using the Greco-Roman model of the city in Greek polis and its territory, its corda. They thought of Egypt on two levels. First, that for all Egypt, Alexandria was the city and Egypt was the Cora. So it's city and territory, that, that's it. Uh, Alexandrians, like Roman citizens, were exempt from the new poll tax and the poll tax was paid by everyone else and everyone else, whatever their ethnicity, were called Egyptians. Right? So you had Alexandrians, don't pay poll tax, Egyptians, the people in the country, they do. However, there is a second level, and within the Egyptians, in the gnomes, the traditional areas, the capital cities were now called metropolis, mother cities, and the uh, inhabitants of the uh, cities paid a reduced poll tax, normally half. And the Romans also created, just to confuse things, a, a different uh, status, which we still don't really understand, called the people from the gymnasium, the gymnasium group. Except in the Arsinoite gnome, they're called the Katoikoi, the settlers, but it's the same people. The gymnasial group, the settlers. <coughs> the gymnasium was quintessentially a Greek institution. So I think all I need to say for today is that this is a sort of local Hellenized elite, cultural elite, and I think that the gymnasium somehow linked them to Alexandria. So two systems, city and <coughs> Alexandria, the city, Egypt, the territory, internal system, metropolis and the gnome, the villagers, and then this group who are somehow link the Hellenized elite of the gnomes to, to the Greek city of Alexandria. So at last we get to, the, to Lucius Pompeius Niger. I know some of you won't be able to read this, but I'll, I'll, I'll read out and keep it. I start with an agreement made in AD 31 by him and his three brothers on the death of their father. This reveals that the man we know as Lucius Pompeius Niger was formerly called Zoilos, uh, that was his name, and that he came from an elite family in the city of Oxyrhynchus, probably of gymnasial status. Their house, we learn, is in the, uh, in, in the Hermes Temple Street, not far from the Serapis uh, Temple. Their father had died bankrupt and they agreed to pay off his debts and then split ownership of the house. Their ethnicity is uncertain, probably Egyptian, but their names reveal an attachment to the worship of Serapis and Isis, of which more later. Uh, two brothers are called Serapion, another one's called Apion, those are Serapis names. A sister is called Thais, which is a Greekized form of Thaisis, Lady of Isis. So they are an Egyptian family, Hellenized, one of them becomes a Roman soldier. Uh, their father, when he dies, notice that what they agree to do, they will have the body of their same father, Syros, peristele, in the Greek word, wrapped for funeral. He is to be mummified. Okay? So here in one document we have a soldier, some gods, and a mummy, and that is how we're going to continue. Lucius Pompeius's career. Quite a few documents deal with his career as a soldier. I'm not going to go through them, but uh, just so you know the outlines. It seems that he was recruited around AD 18. Uh, in AD 19, Germanicus comes out to the east to threaten Parthia, maybe invade. They're probably recruiting up, ready for this. In the army, presumably he learned Latin. Certainly he learned how to file documents. We'll come back to that later. One text shows he started a rather Roman entrepreneurial habit of lending money at interest through a bank. All right, Greeks lent money and at interest, but they didn't on the whole do it through banks. This is Roman. What did he do as a soldier? He probably never fought in a battle, but he might well have been on duty when there were the riots of the Greeks against the Jews in AD 38. In AD 44, he was discharged. In AD 45, um, he was uh, granted, he, together with his children, uh, were granted citizenship, Roman citizenship, by the um, Emperor Claudius, as we learn from his census declaration of 47 
uh, to eight, which is incidentally the only surviving documented case of a Roman census declaration in the whole of Roman history. So that's quite interesting. Now, some of you who know about the Roman army may say, this is weird. Here's this guy, he's got a Roman name, he's in the legion, he gets citizenship and he leaves. That's what auxiliaries are meant to do. And later, not by this time. So he is a very interesting case, but I'm afraid we don't really have time for that. He's not the only Egyptian who joins the Roman uh, armed forces. A lot of them become auxiliaries. Many of them join the fleet. If you go to Ravenna Museum, you look at the tombstones of the fleet people there, every other one is an Egyptian. So it's quite a common phenomenon, the Egyptians joining the Roman army. Were Roman soldiers in Egypt seen as alien oppressors, or were they integrated into local society and agents of Romanization? Of course, soldiers were, uh, I mean, having a garrison is a new thing. The Roman army, a standing army, it's a new thing. Uh, and they are used to enforce Roman rule and taxation. But archives like that of Lucius Pompeius Nigger show that soldiers and veterans, on the whole, were quite closely integrated into, into local society. There is some arch potential archaeological evidence, too. This is a terracotta figurine of a traditional Egyptian deity called Bess. And Bess was the patron of fun, he could be the patron of a Roman society, and childbirth, <coughs> a protector against evil, and that's the important thing. Figurines like this were very common in Roman Egypt, and you kept them in your house to ward off evil spirits, essentially. So how do we often Bess, in the Roman period, is dressed, as you see him here, as a Roman auxiliary soldier. What does that mean? How do we interpret it? Are these figurines used by soldiers who choose Bess as their protective deity? Or does it mean that locals who want their Bess figurine to be really efficacious think he's more powerful now if he's dressed as a Roman soldier, which implies they see Roman soldiers as protectors? I don't have the answer to that, by the way. That's for you. Okay, most of the archive of, uh, uh, of Pompeius deals with events after uh, his uh, discharge. i just give one example here. Uh, a declaration he makes for uh, the local census, the provincial census of AD 62. And there are a few little points to make from this. Lucius, he calls himself Lucius Pompeius, son of Lucius. Of course, he wasn't son of Lucius, he was son of Appian. Uh, from the Polia tribe, Niger, discharged soldier of those having received the donor, the gift of citizenship. I possess in the city of Oxyrhynchus in the Hermes Temple Street a quarter share of a house. You know that one. That's the quarter he got from his father's house. And another one. On, in which, on occasion, I am president and resident there. Uh, and, he, uh, and he says, in the quarter share declared by me, there is no one for registration. Why is there no one for registration? Because he's now a Roman citizen. He doesn't pay the poll tax. He doesn't declare himself. But just like if you've got a property, you have to declare it for the council tax. There is no one. Resident means there is no one due to pay poll tax. He is now no longer an Aegyptius. He is a Roman. Okay. Um, several... Uh, uh, I just thought I'd show you a bit about Op Opsirincus. This is a, a Google Earth uh, picture of the site of Opsirincus, Pompeius's hometown. Um, as you can see, there isn't really a great deal left. In the, this is the site of Oxyrhynchus here, essentially. It goes down to, um, goes down to where the Bar Yusuf was there. Um, uh, one thing you can see, I, I, can't, I can't reach it, up to the top right, you see a little sort of finger sticking out into the fields. And that is almost the, certainly the location of the Byzantine and possibly Ptolemaic Hippodrome. Um, Actually, if this was excavated, there probably is quite a lot of stratigraphy there. It doesn't look very impressive now, but when Petrie went there in 1925, he found uh, the remains of extraordinary colonnaded streets of the second century AD. He found remains, uh, architectural fragments, now just across the road in the BM, actually, in the storerooms, uh, of this enormous theatre, which was the biggest theatre in the whole of Roman North Africa. So Oxyrhynchus isn't quite the little backwater that it's often made out to be. The point is that without formally being cities, by the first century AD, when the first theatre was built, not this one, and through to the second century AD, these cities were urbanising and becoming indistinguishable from a Greco-Roman city anywhere else in, in the empire. 
On with um, Pompeius and his family. Several, we, from several documents, we learn uh, about his relations. He had a daughter called Herenia. She, uh, from uh, letters like this, it appears that she did not live in Oxyrhynchus. She had moved across the desert, not far off, to the Arsinoite Nome, where those villages are, and she lived there. And uh, used to, and she, uh, 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 and various people would write to Pompeius, and he kept their letters. In fact, yes, sorry, the thing I for forgot to mention is that what he does is he sticks letters and receipts together to form a roll of documents. No private person does that. That's what you do in the bureaucracy, in the army. It's one of his army habits he's picked up as filing <laughs> things. He's an inveterate filer. That's why we've got the archive. Okay. Uh, Herenia to Pompeius, her father, many greetings and continual help. I have bought the olives for you. Then this is the key bit I want to say. They are asking from everywhere for pious offerings, Eusebea, for the shrine of Sukos, from Romans and Alexandrians and the Katoikoi, the settlers, the gymnasial group in Yarsinoi. They are asking Pompeius. I haven't given anything. Indeed, today I was expecting that he would come. We pray you are well, so that you don't forget your children. Receive another letter from your son, grandson, that means, Syrian. There's a blank space. We send regards to you and Caritas and so on. We know from another letter that Herenia could sign her name. Is she literate or not? Difficult to say. If you can afford someone to write your letters, you use someone to write your letters. Clearly, she's dictating this letter. She says, tell him, the scribe sometimes remembers these men to say, I ask you, but then sometimes writes, tell him, you know, instead. So he, that shows this is being dictated. Grandson Syrian is learning how to write. Three blank, uh, blank spaces left for him to write, hello, grandpa, which he doesn't get round to doing, but there, 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 there we go. So they missed out on that. The uh, thing about the, the offerings, Sukos, the pious offerings for Sukos. Sukos is the uh, Egyptian, the local Egyptian god, uh, crocodile god, Sobek, the patron of the Arsinoite gnome. Uh, more, uh, I'll show you him in a moment. The thing here to note is the way this group have switched allegiance. The implication of this is that Sobek is now seen as an Egyptian deity, that normally only Egyptians get asked for pious offerings to Sobek. But the priest, maybe needing money for their library, uh, are asking the rich people, the Romans, the Alexandrians, and the gymnasial group. It shows you that there is beginning to be a distinction between these are Egyptian cults and they are for Egyptians normally. It's not a, there's not a wall because they are asking, but it shows that there are beginning to be perceptions that there is, these deities are appropriate to these Hellenized groups and these deities are not. Let's have a look at Sobek. There he is. Uh, across, uh, well, he, this is from a temple uh, at um, Teptunus, a relief with him, Newton, being uh, uh, and the Tol King uh, Ptolemy uh, on the uh, right. Uh, and he is, as I said, the patron god of the Arsinoite gnome, and it's, that shows uh, where uh, Herenia now lives. This is um, an aerial view and then a view of a street at, uh, at Ted Tunis. This might be where Herenia was, was living. It's difficult to say. Sobek had a temple in every Fayum town and village. Uh, this is Ted Tunis. There is the outline of where the temple was. There is its dromos, the processional way, which leads up there. Uh, uh, and then this is the main housing area uh, of the uh, Roman, uh, Roman period village. Um, <coughs> I, I wanted to mention this because this is uh, Teptunus, the temple here, has produced one of the most extraordinary archives we have from Roman Egypt. We have more or less the, the collections of the books and writings of the priests. And these give us an indication of what was going on in an Egyptian temple of this period. And it's fascinating that what the priests were co co keeping and, and translating, they were interested in learning proper Egyptian. They copied out Middle Egyptian tomb inscriptions so that they were learning traditional hieroglyphs and so on. But they also copied out the Iliad and they also copied out uh, Dioscorides De Materia Medica, medical treatises. They kept lists of Roman consuls so they could translate Roman dates into Greek dates. In other words, what they're doing is they are preserving, they're not just preserving 
Egyptian culture, they are transmuting it and, uh, and, in, uh, and integrating it with the dominant Hellenic culture and the Roman political culture. And Sobek himself makes efforts to adapt. Around the first century AD, he uh, forgets how to speak Demotic, and if you want to ask him an oracle question, you have to start doing it in Greek, and he starts giving his replies in Greek. So even Sobek is Hellenizing uh, in, in, in this period. What goes on around him changes too. Um, this is looking down, that's all that's left of the, t of the temple. <coughs> There's nothing. Uh, that's why you can't see it. Down this dromos, which is extended in the Roman period, one of the things that happens in the Roman period is the dromos had always been a centre of commercial and social life in villages. People, you know, this great big paved street, people would set up stalls and so on. In the Rome period, you start getting these communal rooms flanking it. They're called date materia. We've got inscriptions. We know what they are. They're dining rooms. You rent them out. You have parties. A big social development of the Roman period is that people start celebrating birthdays. Right, Greeks celebrated birthdays, but they didn't have parties. In the Rome period, you have parties. People start drinking wine instead of uh, drinking beer. Uh, they eat pork, kebabs. So, you know, it's kebab and wine party time. You, know, you, you dress up with wreaths and, and, and so on. And this is a, a, a Roman-style dining reaches the villages of, uh, of Roman Egypt. Back to um, our, our friend um, Pompeius and his daughter Herenia. This is the sad bit, handkerchiefs out. This is a letter to Pompeius from another woman called Thalbas. It started off, Polychairin, many greetings. Then she told the scribe to cancel many. Alexandros, uh, is, uh, it says, Thavos to her father Pompeius, greetings. You would do well on the receipt of my letter to come immediately on account of the death of your unfortunate daughter, Herenia, after coming safely through a premature birth on the 9th of Fiope. She gave birth to an eight-month boy dead and lived on for four days and after that died and was properly wrapped for funeral by us and her husband, and was placed at Alabanthus, so that if you come and wish to, you can see her. Best wishes from Alexandros and the children. Alexandros, presumably her husband. Eight-month baby. Anne Hansen brilliantly showed that in the Greek medical literature, when you want to say that there was, no, there was nothing anyone could do, right? it's not because someone made a mistake or something went wrong. You call it an eight-month baby. It was an eight-month baby. There was nothing anyone could do. doesn't mean it literally was. Uh, interesting, this is something in Greek medical writing, it's picked up as a common metaphor, it occurs in all the letters. Everyone now knows this. Shows how medical thought percolates down. Um, the uh, interesting, uh, it's an old Egyptian habit to mummify the dead. That goes back ages. Herenia, like her grandfather, is to be mummified. What's different, uh, and she's going to be visible to Pompeius for 30 days because for 30 days she's taken to the mummification station. The body is desiccated uh, for 30 days naturally and so it's still visible before it's mummified. What happens in, uh, in, in, in the early days when the Greeks come to Egypt in the 3rd century, they go on cremating themselves. As the, that's the Greek and Roman tradition's cremation. By the end of the Ptolemaic period, elite Greeks are having themselves mummified. Mummification is expensive. It's only done by a few. What happens is the technique of mummification changes, so that by the early Roman period, it's much cheaper and it's simpler. Instead of all the messy stuff, you just kind of put people in pickle, really, in natural and, uh, and so on. And because it's cheaper, it becomes a middle-class sort of <coughs> operation. And this is something that is just getting going around the period that Herenia dies. Um, the first thing that the, the, the new, this new urban elite, people like Pompeius, Alexandros, the, these people, the first thing they start doing is gilding mummies. Bling. Right? You can see this, and there's the famous Baharia oasis of the golden mummies hacked out by, I've forgotten his name, Mursby, so you can't see me because I won't have said it. Um, and, and you can see that they're showing off their sort of, their lifestyle, that they are absolutely covered with that's a traditional Ptolemaic type bracelet, uh, you, you, numerous um, necklaces. Uh, you can see that this is meant to be a coloured tunic and so on. This is all uh, smart hairstyles, big earrings and so on. They're showing off. And these bunches of flowers, that's for going to a party. That shows you're on your way to a party. So that happens a bit, but not very much in the Fayum. What happens in the Fayum, and is more distinctive, is they start inserting 
in the mummies veristic style portraits. In other words, portraits that look individual. Now, it doesn't mean they are portraits, it, but they are designed to look like this. And there was a big exhibition many years ago at the British Museum of these, at which Susan Walker put forward the idea, which must be right, in part, that this is a reflection of Roman cultural practice. The Romans notoriously keep imagines, veristic style images of their forebears, that this, they, that goes down to freedmen doing these busts of themselves, and it comes to Egypt, and in the Fayum in particular, it's found in the insertion of these portraits into mummies. Yes, that is true, it is partly Romanization, but it's more than that. Uh, this is a mummy in a coffin. Now, you'll notice the curious thing about this mummy is that it's actually wrapped in a diagonal fashion. Okay? And this shows that there's another concern of these people, and it relates to the myth of Osiris, as developed and popularised in the Greco-Roman period. Now, it's an old Egyptian myth that Osiris is king of the dead, and that he has a, uh, he's king of the dead, originally. And that he's king of the dead because he starts off as ruler of the world, but then he has this bust up with his brother Seth, you boo when Seth is mentioned, you see. And Seth cuts up Osiris into pieces, and uh, his sister wife, Isis, collects the pieces and sticks them back together again. And so when you show yourself in a mummy like this, you are like Osiris. You've been re your pieces have been put together and bound back together. That's the significance of that. Now, gradually the myth develops. A lot of what you're told is sold as Egyptian religion is, in fact, what Plutarch calls Egyptian religion. It's not traditional Egyptian religion. It's Greek interpretation of those things. And the way it develops is that Osiris gets merged with Apis and becomes Serapis. That happens in the Ptolemaic period. Serapis is a god much favoured by the Ptolemies. And you get this... And, and what then becomes important is that their son becomes important, Harpocrates. Harpocrates is the young Horus... The Horus is the ruler of the world. But they don't focus so much now on Horus or Osiris. They focus on the trinity of Serapis, Isis, and Harpocrates. And one of the most common figurines in the whole of Roman Egypt is the young Harpocrates with his fingers to his mouth in what is apparently an apotropaic thing. And, and this is the big cut. And it's the interesting thing is, although everyone says Serapis is Ptolemaic, it's only in the Roman period, 1st to 2nd centuries, that lots of people start calling themselves Appion, Serapion, Tiesis, and so on, just like this family. In other words, it's a, a, a middle-class uh, development of this period. And one of the other things that happens in this period is that people start marrying their sisters, which is presumably part of actually living out the, the, the uh, dynastic tri triad that you are uh, now worshipping. Sorry, I've jumped one, I think. OK, lastly a bit, these portraits are an elite habit. Only 1% to 2% of mummies in a handful of cemeteries have them. And it's clear from the portraits that we're dealing with the urban elite. This one is absolutely clear-cut. This is clearly, this is second century, actually. It's clearly a, a Hellenic uh, person wearing a Hellenic keton, uh, uh, beard, uh, the, uh, the diadem of a Hellenic priest, um, and so on. So that's big. Things like this are fairly clear. This is a rather more extraordinary thing. This is a, a little household shrine. And what it's representing is a young boy uh, who is an ephebe. He's in the gymnasial train. You can see that because he's naked. He's got an olive wreath around him, the wreath for athletic victory. Uh, it also, uh, he's got, um, he's now got to the stage, at, I should have said, you, you have the Horus lot you cut when you're 14 and then you wear the footballer's mullet is then what you wear as, a, as an ephebe. And part of being in the gymnasium is that you learn Greek literature, right? You, you learn some writing and so on. This is part of your Hellenist education. So this is celebrating a young, Hellenized Greek, Egyptian, Syrian, whoever. But it's done in a traditional Egyptian style with the Egyptian offerings to the dead along the bottom. This is a very blended culture, isn't it? A pair of portraits, often said to be mother and boy, simply because they're done by the same artist. <laughs> Obviously, he did one sort of face. Do you want male face? Female face. That's, that's all that he, he does. Right? But, the, but the things about them, they, you can see this is the new Italy. This guy, he's not yet an ephib. He's died before he's 14. He's wearing what we... He's imitating the, the hairstyle, the Horus lock of the young Harpocrates. Uh, he would then cut that off, and then he'd grow his mullet when he became an ephib. Uh, he's wearing... Uh, uh, an amulet. Now, the Greeks and Egyptians did that, but this amulet is in the distinctive form of a Roman bulla, the way that Romans wore uh, amulets. 
He's wearing a Greek-style tunic, but it's got two dark red bands down. Dark red bands, clawy, are a Roman status marker. Uh, they're something that th these people adopt to show their status. His mother, um, one of the things is, without the benefit of Hello magazine, the women of the Fayum knew the hairstyle of the empress of the day. That's how we can date these things. They keep on changing their hairstyles and their, and their earrings uh, and their jewellery. You can see she is rather finely dressed, very nice tunic here, nice throat, big gold collar and so on. And they're in party mode, right? What we are getting here is an indication of what I'm claiming is a new culture coming out in Roman Egypt in the first century amongst this new urban elite created in part by the Romans, but you can see very much defining themselves. Uh, and, and this is what I would call Romano-Egyptian culture. In the end, how does one interpret it? You find figurines like this from the British Museum. This is, uh, uh, if we didn't have the head, you'd say bronze statue of an emperor as commander. But the head is the head of Horus. And the question is, is this statuette dedicated by Egyptian priests who want Horus to go on having power and think, let's represent him as a Roman soldier, to the, a Roman emperor, because that's now the image of power? Or is this the Romans saying, we want the emperor to attract Egyptian support, let's bung a Horus head on to show that Horus and the emperor are, are the same thing? I don't know the answer, that's over to you. Thank you. Mm -hmm.